the message will come to us from Mr. Stanley. Mr. R. Stanley is an engineer. He started off his life as a civil engineer. He did his BE, Bachelor of Engineering, and also his Master of Technology in the Indian Institute of Technology in Madras. And therefore, he, is, he has not started his life basically as a theologian or a seminarian. He has started his life as a civil builder. And he has been chosen by the Lord to build his church. We would like to listen to him because he is a man who talks and makes the walk. And over to Mr. Stanley to speak to us. Good evening, every one of you, and greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a great privilege and honor that I should be invited to speak in this commissioning service of the graduating students of this batch. Thank you for the introduction, which I don't really feel I deserve, but I want to really reflect all the glory unto the Lord. This evening, as I stand before you, my heart bubbles with joy because I have been working with young people ever since the Lord met me during my first year of college in the year 1962. I did not begin my ministry as a pulpit preacher, but I was a campus minister working with students, especially at professional colleges in South India, both in the engineering and medical colleges. And as the Lord brought across us at least 30 or 40 of the professional college students who were really burdened to see something happening in India in our generation, we were praying for about seven or eight years, almost daily, for about two hours after our laboratory classes would be over and workshops practice. And that gave birth to a ministry that is presently known as Blessing Youth Mission. And this ministry, which is now in its 30th year, wants to record a great word of thanks to God and gratefulness. Because what has gone on during the last 30 years has been a real legend what young people can do. I'm always excited about working with young people. I have great regards for old people because I am becoming old myself. So now at the 30th year, when I talk to people that I still continue to lead this ministry, they say, you are no more young. I say, of course, in one sense. But I believe that the reason why God in church history all through has chosen young people to lead missionary movements is very simple. There are many differences between young people and old people, but I can think of just one this evening. When you ask a young man to do a job, or when you ask an old man to do a job, there is a basic difference. When you ask an old person to do a job, he asks several questions. But when you ask a young person to do a job, he first finishes the work and then asks questions. This is the basic difference. It's not just a theory, but it's something which I have consistently and practically observed in working with young people, not just for fancy evangelism, but for active missionary evangelism with down-to-earth reality, working in pioneering difficult situations. You give them the task, you make the challenge as difficult as possible. The more difficult the challenge is, the deeper their commitment is. That's what I have consistently found. And that's what gives me real excitement this evening to stand before you. I want to really say a few words this evening, which I believe you would constantly remember when you go from here in whatever situation the Lord would lead you to. I want to talk to you this evening about how to be all out for God in the context of missionary evangelism. How to be a head-to-foot missionary evangelist. You can also reword this title as the anatomy of missionary evangelism. Now whatever I want to share with you this evening, I believe by the grace of God, 
my associates and I have been consistently practicing and exercising and we are seeing results and witnessing fruits in the ministry. So as you go out of this college campus with your degree, I believe that if you could take these lessons with you, these would be of enduring value wherever the Lord would plant you. The first thing that we need to have to be a head-to-foot evangelist or to head-to-foot a missionary. I will speak about seven things this evening with the 35 minutes given to me. The first thing that I believe that we should constantly remember to have, we should also endeavor to have, is bright eyes. Or in the context of missions, in the language of missiology, we would say the vision. If you turn with me to John's Gospel, 4th chapter, you can just note down these references and study them at leisure. I will read a few verses and I am using New King James Version. John's Gospel, 4th chapter, where the Lord Jesus Christ was right in the midst of his conversation with the woman at Samaria. When the disciples came with bread that they had purchased in the villages, he told them from verse 31 to 35, In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? But Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, now that's where the message begins, but I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. If you need to maintain the enthusiasm and zeal that you have possibly imbibed here in this institution as you are listening to lectures, this is where you need to start. You should constantly keep yourself updated with the needs of the people. Keep seeing the people. Sometimes we lose touch with the people and still preach on the pulpits and we become totally irrelevant. So the most important thing that I believe for your ministry to be fruitful, especially as a missionary or evangelist or a missionary evangelist or whatever, Keep your eyes on the needs of the people. Where there is no vision, people perish. We have to understand that. Now, if you allow me, I may slightly paraphrase that statement, or rather I will interpret that scripture. Where there is no vision for the leaders, people perish. So here the Lord Jesus Christ is calling his co-workers to develop and to get a vision. You know, this is not good English. Nobody says, lift up your eyes and look. They simply say, look there, look yonder. But Jesus said, lift up your eyes and look. Because when we move into the ministry or when you move into our life situation, it is very easy for us to be caught up with the mundane details of life that we lose sight of things beyond our immediate. So it is necessary that we constantly keep our eyes wide open to see what is happening beyond. Many young people, when I speak in youth conferences, ask me, Anand, how did you leave your job? What made you to resign your career? Did you hear an audible voice? Did you see a flashy vision? I tell them, it's now about 38 years I have walked with the Lord Jesus Christ by His grace. I never once heard an audible voice, nor seen a vision, but I have seen the needs of people. I lived with people in the poorest of the poor society and sections. And I have lived in some tribal herds, right in the midst of some tribal regions in Orissa. I have lived with them, and I have seen what it is to be on this face of the earth for 80 years, 90 years, 95 years and die without ever hearing once the name of the Lord Jesus Christ just because no evangelist ever walked into that village. I have seen it and when I had seen it I could not but leave my job and come to the ministry. Till now 
that is the greatest motivating factor of my life the Lord Jesus Christ when he touched that blind man and asked him how do you see he said I see men like trees and Jesus gave him a second touch I honestly believe beloved that most of us in the Christian ministries we need a third touch from God we should not see men as men but we should see men as eternal souls may the Lord give us that touch so that every time you see a man and every time you see a woman without the Lord Jesus Christ your heart should burn with indignation over the devil who has kept them under this illegal bondage for generation and ages and you should just be tiptoeing to go and get him and snatch him for the kingdom of God may the Lord give us these bright eyes the vision the second thing we need to have when we talk about missionary evangelism is a bleeding heart vision begets passion if you look at a very interesting passage where the Lord Jesus Christ first time perhaps gave a call for missionary evangelism we read in Matthew's Gospel 9th chapter verse 36 I'm sure by now because of the frequent reference that might have been made in your classrooms this, this passage you would have even memorized it look at that verse 35 and then verse 36 Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in the synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people in other words Jesus as an individual he did all that he could but I like that word but in 36 that's where the message gets its emphasis he did all he could personally individually but when he saw the multitudes he was moved with compassion for them this is what I said he saw and he was moved with a passion this is what I said vision begets passion Jesus saw the teeming millions the untold millions as sheep shattered without a shepherd and there was a moving compassion that gripped him this was Paul's passion also in the passage that was just read to us if you go to the previous chapter he says I wish I myself were cursed for my fellow men the Hebrew people who have a zeal but it is not according to knowledge I often used to wonder where did Paul get that kind of a compelling passionate urge to reach his own kith and kin for the Lord Jesus Christ he went to such an extent that he said curse me in order to if necessary bless my people now that was a very daring statement if my people could be blessed and in order that my people should be blessed if I need to be cursed I would rather be cursed where did he get that kind of a daring passion I believe he got it from his Old Testament counterpart Moses who once told the Lord Lord you either forgive the people or forget me you either forgive the people or delete my name from the book which you have written now how many of us would dare to honestly make a prayer like this Lord either save India or kill me you know there was a man who prayed like that Lord give me souls or take away my soul I think we need to have that kind of a passion it's not mere knowledge it's not the principles and steps and procedures and methods that you learn for missionary way all these things are necessary and they have a place and they are good but I tell you a man with a passion he is able to accomplish much 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 more than a person who is so well trained in all methods and who is so good in all the knowledge of missiology but whose heart is empty and cold ask the Lord every morning before you take and carry your missionary bag or you go out to do some evangelism Lord let my heart be broken with which breaks your heart 
That which breaks your heart, Lord, let it break my heart too. The prayer of the founder of World Vision, as we all know. Lord, let me pray like Paul. Let me pray like Moses. Lord, bless India or curse me. I think we should make a prayer like that. We have not a prayer like that. Our prayers have been too selfish. Bless me, bless me, bless me. And occasionally, we say, Lord, bless other people. This is what bothers me when I attend some of the worship services. Keep on saying, Oh God, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me. I believe, brothers and sisters, we have heard enough of messages about our privilege to be blessed. But we have not heard enough about our responsibility to be a blessing. God told Abraham, I will bless you, and we stop there. But God also told Abraham, I will make you a blessing. May the Lord give every one of us, not only as we go out from here tomorrow or day after, but every day before we set out to work, a heart that bleeds for the people who are dying without Christ. I would like to make a quotation which I have constantly kept before me whenever I feel quite cold in my own commitment to missions. Especially when I talk to people who are without the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it was an old Quaker who said, I will preach like a dying man to dying men. The third requisite of a man who should be all out for God as a missionary evangelist is bent knees. First, it's bright eyes. Second, it's a bleeding heart. And third, it is bent knees. Here we talk about not just prayer, but intercession. As we all know, in this very passage, which I just now read to you from Matthew's Gospel, 9th chapter, the Lord told His disciples in verse 37 and 38, Then He said to the disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore that the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Later he would say in the same gospel, go therefore. Before he said, go therefore, he said, pray therefore. Shall I tell you one of the commonest mistakes that we do as preachers or missionaries or evangelists? Once we come to full-time ministry or once we take up Christian ministry as our vocation, we ask everybody else to pray for us and we believe that people are praying for us and we don't need to do the praying. Now this, I tell you, is the greatest peril in Christian ministry. No man, in the words of Leonard Ravenhill, whom I always admire and quote, no man is greater than his prayer or his prayer life. Now as you leave this institution after such lengthy training, please ask a question. What commitment and improvement I have made in my life of prayer when I go from here. I want to tell you, it may not be an exaggeration, everything else depends on your commitment to spend time with God in prayer. If you want to do more for God, you should be more with God. Before you can come on your beautiful feet, you should be on your bent knees. This is the most important, crucial requisite of everyone who wants to accomplish something for God. I still remember once listening to Dr. Billy Graham. He was speaking about the three secrets of evangelism. Usually his sermons are three-point sermons as we all know. So one day he began his sermon. Today I'm going to speak about three secrets of evangelism. Everybody immediately, as usual, took up their pen and paper. And he said, the first secret of evangelism is prayer. And he said, the second secret of evangelism is prayer. And you know what the third secret is? Prayer. More prayer is more power. Less prayer is less power. And no prayer is no power. The apostles, they prayed. They prayed again. We all pray sometimes to God, Lord, give me the double portion of the prophet Elijah. But you know what was the secret of that man's power? It is not there in the Old Testament. But it is there in a single statement in the New Testament when Apostle James quotes 
Elijah, he says, Elijah was a man of like passions. He prayed, and then it says, he prayed again. I want to underline that word, again. Most of us pray, but very few of us pray again. Only when you pray again, you move from prayer to intercession. So brothers and sisters, if I have time and energy, I would come down from this podium and hold each of your hands and plead with you to commit yourselves to regular, consistent, unhurried prayer so the Lord would richly anoint you and the devil would fear you and the kingdom of God shall be benefited through you. May the Lord make us men and warriors of prayer. Fourthly, the requisite of a man who must be all out for God for missions and evangelism is bold lips. Bold lips proclamation. This does not come naturally. Sometimes we take it for granted that once you become a full-fledged, full-trained, full-equipped missionary evangelist, anytime you want to open the mouth, you can just like that speak like Niagara. It does not happen like that. It didn't happen with Paul. That's why more than once in the New Testament, when he writes to his own congregational members, you know what he says? Pray for me that I may open my mouth boldly, that I may speak as I ought to speak. A champion, a missionary champion like Paul, depended upon the prayers of God's people, so he would be given boldness. Not the content of his message, not that he would have a free flow when he started preaching, but that he would have boldness to speak as he ought to speak. You know, there are times, especially when we stand in difficult situations, our throat is choked and we are not able to freely open up our mouths and proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Before Christians, it becomes very easy. But when I have stood before some of the non-Christians, especially in areas where we know for sure that people are totally hostile and they have totally different philosophies and religions and you have to talk to them. You should not lose their favor at the same time you cannot compromise on your message and you have to talk to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. You need boldness. And this is something which the Lord can give us again when we wait before Him. When we stand before Him in prayer. Never ever stop personal witnessing. Missionary evangelism is not always preaching. Essentially and basically and fundamentally, missionary evangelism is personal sharing of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I still read in Acts 20:20, 20, 20, Apostle Paul, he spoke in the synagogues and daily he met with people in the marketplaces, not only in the meeting places on a pulpit, but in the marketplaces with those who met with him. That was one to one. I like the theme that is given to us for this conference, for this program. Each one, reach one and teach one. In the words of D.L. Moody, hand-plucked fruit is always the best one. I did not come to the Lord Jesus Christ attending conventions or conferences, but one of the professors in the college where I was studying met with me one evening with an open Gideon New Testament across the street corner and he cornered me. And that day I committed my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. He would have never realized that he was talking to a young man who one day would become an instrument in the hand of the Lord for the blessing of thousands. Yesterday I met with him and I thanked him profusely. He was quite sick. I met with him, I thanked him very profusely for what he has done in my life. And this morning as I just moved into the campus, there are several people who received us and one gentleman who is a staff here, he shook hands with me and said, Anan, I came to Christ after listening to you and I am a minister of God here. We had a good lunch that was very encouraging and we enjoyed it. And we are given an air-conditioned room that's a luxury for us. Everything is fine, but the thing that 
so exciting to me ever since I entered this campus was the testimony of one staff of this institution who held my hands tightly this morning and said that he came to Christ and I was instrumental for that. Dear brothers and sisters, I am sure that in the classrooms you would have been given that simple arithmetic which I believe was first given by Pat Robertson. I don't know maybe uh, whether I am right in quoting the source. He said if you are a congregation of about 100 members and you begin personally soul winning in the month of January in the same principle of each one, reach one and teach that person. Each one, reach one other person and make that person a soul winner. If you do that, you become 200 in February and you become 400 in March and you become 800 in April and you become 1600 in May and you become 3200 in June and if you keep multiplying like that you become 204,800 people when you come to December for Christmas celebration and let us allow for 50% backsliding that's a very high percentage and you will still be left leaving out the odd and making it even rounding it off you are still left with 100,000 people 100 members without any campaign expense without inviting any special preacher without printing a handbill or pasting a wall poster just each one reaching one person during 30 days and making that person a soul winner 100 will swell up to 100,000 in one year <clears throat> you wonder how it happens this is how the early church multiplied of all the missiological principles and procedures and methods everything that is taught I am very sorry to tell you with an observation that we are yet to understand the dynamism of personal soul winning and discipling now I believe in a country like India our governments and some of our leaders may stop our mass evangelism, crusade evangelism and even open air evangelism but they cannot stop one person gossiping the gospel to another person. Amen? Amen. And I believe brothers and sisters this is what you should commit yourself to. That was the secret of the ministry of Buxing who passed away from us just a few weeks ago. He never ever considered it below his dignity to do personal evangelism or distribute tracts to someone on the streets. Brothers and sisters, will you commit yourselves to it? I will be a personal soul winner. Who had so many masses following the like the Lord Jesus Christ? But yet he was a personal soul winner. Even on the cross, he was a personal soul winner. He won 50% of his congregation to, cry, to the kingdom. Two people were crucified with him and one person he won for the kingdom. He was a personal soul winner. You put him anywhere, he was a personal soul winner. Be bold. To preach on the pulpit, you need less boldness than to speak to one person when you travel in a train. Do you believe that? It's very easy to preach on pulpits. But to open up a conversation with a smile when you sit in a, in, a, in, a, in a AC compartment, in the train, or you fly, it's very difficult. But may the Lord give you that kind of boldness and maintain that till you breathe last and you never regret it. Whatever I speak to you, please keep them constantly remembered and you will not go fruitless. Fifthly, we must have blessing hands. Jesus is no more in physical body on earth today. Our hands should be the extension of his hands. I often used to think why Jesus touched people for healing. There was no need for Jesus to touch people for healing. Even a dead man with a word if he could rise to life, why should he touch people who were sick? I think he was ministering unto them. He was blessing them. He was just embracing them to tell them, to give them the warmth of love. No wonder when he would divide people into the left and to the right. To those who were on the right he would say, I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, you came to save me. I was a stranger, you housed me. I was foodless, 
you fed me I was naked you clothed me what you did to one of the little ones you have done unto me the most important thing is these people were doing all these things without their own knowledge and that will be the greatest pleasant surprise we all will have that's the surprise I want every one of you to have so in your busy schedule of preaching and conducting services ministering so on and so forth never lose sight of that man who is almost dead on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho don't be too busy like the Levite he was a religious man don't be too busy like the priest who was a religious man they are left-siders, they are not righteous but be like that Samaritan who had time he was also a busy man in fact he had to go on a journey and he was at the fag end of his journey that's why what he was left with only two coins nothing more but yet he spent time he took time to minister to that person I still believe that the evangelical world in India needs to produce people of the order of Mother Teresa I believe that we need to produce people like that so that when such a person dies a communist chief minister can stand up and bow down before that body otherwise they won't easily bow down before a body you know that? that's the most powerful language so we evangelicals we need to understand that so wherever you come across people who are in suffering and need go there touch them embrace them and never think that you are wasting your time sixthly the Lord should give us beautiful feet always ready invasion shoes of readiness how beautiful are the feet of those who go proclaiming heralding that the Lord reigns what I want to stress in this context is that you should go out sometimes we talk about missionary evangelism but we never go out this is a basic lesson that we teach in missionary evangelism go out go out go where the people are don't expect people to come to you you know the church bell concept you know come 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 now Jesus never wanted us go and call people to come but Jesus said you go to the people you go where the sinners are if possible you get a copy of the book by T.L. Osborne out where the sinners are soul winning out where the sinners are you go the word gospel cannot be spelt without spelling the word go and two-thirds of the word God is go so you go get out don't just get into some comfort zone especially when the Lord blesses your ministry it's very easy for us to stay stuck somewhere keep moving I like the name given by George Werber to his ministry operation huh? mobilization keep moving all the time keep mobilizing you know it's active just go to the people move into the people never stay put anywhere go into the people there is always a vacuum wherever we are you know the world the, uh, the industrial world and the business world and the office everywhere they talk about vacancy for job but I tell you when you talk about evangelism it's not vacancy there is a vacuum no one is there so go there just go there will be always somebody in India you walk two feet forward two feet on the left and two feet on the right you will hit at least ten sinners just two feet anywhere ten sinners I am not exaggerating that's why India is a land of the greatest opportunity we have people India means people India means potential soul for the kingdom I thank Emil Arnon for singing that song in the air Parlohate Nirapur somebody has now removed that word but I think we should fill go out where the people are move into them talk to them touch them moving out and husband and wife if you are there in a locality where you don't see many other Christians with you to accompany you as a husband and wife you can go as a Aquila and Priscilla you can move out see wonderful things happening and 
don't be spending too much time with Christians. Here is a warning that I want to sound here. When you are in this campus and you talk about missionary evangelism, missiology and all that, you'll talk about reaching the unreached, reaching the unreached. But the moment you go to the Christian world, I tell you, there is a big snare and there is a big trap awaiting you to put you to minister to Christians. You know what is the greatest sin of the century? We preach to the priests, we bless the blessed, we convert the converted, and we baptize the baptized. We comfort the comforted, but we neglect the neglected. That's what's happening. You take all the radio programs in India, Christian radio programs. I challenge you, more than 90% of them will have only Christians in mind. Do you know according to Barrett, the great mission researcher, 95% of Christian money is spent on Christians. Will you please change that order and the trend? I challenge you. I leave the challenge with you, dear brothers and sisters. Think of non-Christians. Even the non-Christian converts who have become evangelists, they are spending time with Christians only. Everybody is interested in that 3%. Who will think of that 97%? Who will get that Pauline spirit? I will not build on another man's foundation, rather I will go where Christ is not named. I'm a heart patient, but I'm shouting because this is the greatest concern today for me. So when you go out, given a choice, everybody will say, oh that's God's leading, God is blessing you, you see God is using you. Let God bless you, God use you. You go out of Antioch. God will bless everybody everywhere. You go where? there is need and move to the non-christian community and win them for Jesus Christ never forget it seventhly and lastly we should have a binding body I'm talking about Christian unity I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ I'm talking about bringing people into fellowship Jesus said a nation that is divided against itself shall not stand a city that is divided against itself shall not stand and a family that is divided against itself shall not stand. Shall we add a church that is divided against itself? I don't want to say it shall not stand, but I would like to ask a question. Will it stand then? Will it stand then? Are we telling the world, divided we stand? Are we telling the world, divided we stand? No other community in India or in the world is so divided as the Church of Jesus Christ. Are you aware of that? And Jesus has prayed in that great high priestly prayer for our oneness. So do all that is possible as you move from here to forget the petty differences and partner with people as much as possible. So that together we'll bring this nation to the Lord Jesus Christ. I always remember the story of a few sailors, crewmen, fighting against one another on the upper deck when they saw one of the passengers just slipping into the sea inadvertently. Immediately these crewmen, they forgot their fight. They just, everybody put their efforts together to rescue the dying man. Brothers and sisters, if evangelism does not unify us, nothing else will. So may the Lord give you grace as you move from here, whatever denominational label you may have, whatever doctrinal affiliation or conviction you may have. If you come across another person who is interested to win another person for Jesus Christ, in the name of Christ, he is your brother, he is your sister. Shake hands with him. Work together with that person, because in India, with the only 3% or 4% Christians, we cannot afford the luxury of division. Let me repeat, in a land like India, where 97% is non-Christian, and only 3% Christian, we cannot afford the luxury 
of divisions and disunity. Let us all remember, I am a Tamilian, I would like to quote one Tamil proverb. Yar kutna lenna nelli arsi ana pod. There is no English uh, equivalent for that, but I'll try to translate it. It matters not who pounds the paddy, provided it becomes rice. Shall you all stand up? All eyes closed and all heads bowed down and hearts lifted up. We have had such a lengthy training, study, teaching, so many long hours we spent patiently in this campus, either as regular students or as extension students. And as we come to this culmination of this course, I believe the climaxing of the entire program is our commitment. Oh God, give me bright eyes which never grow dim. Oh God, bless me with a bleeding heart which never grows cold. Oh God, grant me bent knees which never become too stiff. God, bless me with bold lips which never hesitate to open. O oh God, bless me with blessing hands which never turn to become selfish. O oh God, bless me with beautiful feet which never would become lazy. God, help me to work towards a binding body which thinks not in terms of personal glory or profit, but the good of the kingdom. Ask the Lord to give you this sevenfold blessing so you may be an all out, head to foot missionary. From this moment onwards, until the Lord calls you home, with a well done. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening for the words that we have meditated. In the context of each one, reaching one, and teaching one, till the last man and the last woman is touched with the gospel of your dear son. Father, we pray that the commitment that we make this evening shall be constantly remembered and realized, lest we drift away from these fundamentals any time due to any reason, until we bring in the sheep to submit them at your feet rejoicing. Thank you for the faculty, thank you for the student body, thank you for all the staff of this campus who have worked day and night for several months and years to bring these students to this final stage of their academic career. And as they move into ground realities to the practical world, I pray, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit shall go before them and with them and work in them. And let each one of them be like Jesus Christ the missionary and Apostle Paul who followed Jesus Christ in every detail. So he could say, follow me as I follow Jesus. We give you all glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray.